Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to go over an 11th Circuit Fair Credit Reporting Act case, Erickson versus First Advantage Background Services. And what this case will really teach us about is how does the 11th Circuit view what's known as Section 1681EB. This is the reasonable procedures for maximum possible accuracy. What exactly does that mean? What is an inaccuracy? There's been some differences between courts about how to define that. And then we'll see how does this particular court, this particular case, approach this. The context is a background screening where the plaintiff, the consumer, was flagged as potentially being a sex offender, or at least his name was. And then he ultimately sues, and then the court makes a ruling on that. So let's take a look at it. The, see what we have. So Keith Erickson had his heart set on catch, uh, coaching his son's little league team. And so as part of that, he authorizes a sex offender records search. You know, he has no worries. His record's clean. But then his name has a match. And it's his estranged father who actually was a sex offender. And so he eventually sues First Advantage. That's the credit reporting agency. Same thing as... Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. It's just, this is more a background. Do you have a criminal record, sex offender, that type of thing. And he says, look, you failed to comply with Fair Credit Reporting Act's maximum possible accuracy standard. So the question that the court faced, and let's go back up top. This was the end of 2020. So it's still a pretty recent case. The question is, what does that standard, maximum possible accuracy, what does that require? And they decide what that means is it has to be factually correct and free from potential for misunderstanding. A lot of times people make the mistake of saying that if you find an inaccuracy, you also have to prove that it would uh, confuse potential creditors, for example. That's not the standard, at least not the standard in the 11th Circuit and most other places. And they say... Because the report here meets that standard of being both factually correct and free from potential for misunderstanding, they affirm the district court or the trial judge dismissing the case. So let's get into this a little bit more. So he wants to be an assistant coach. He authorizes Little League to run a background check, which includes registered sex offender records. And his name at that time, Keith Dodson, he gave that name, his date of birth, social, home address. So they give this to First Advantage. That's a consumer reporting agency, a CRA. And then they check their own records, First Advantage does, as well as Experian Public Records, Inc. So that's another consumer reporting agency. And we did a video a few days back about, you have to understand there are dozens and dozens and dozens of credit reporting agencies for sort of every purpose under the sun. So these are just two examples that we often don't think about, but here we have Experian Public Records and the first advantage. So how do they do a search for sex offender records? So they put in the name, complete date of birth, and the social. And they say it's not uncommon, so let's flip that around, it's common for the database to contain a sex offender registry record without the underlying record of conviction. And that's significant because that would help us to know, okay, this has your name, but is it really you? And then they say for some jurisdictions, including the one at play here, the database, for reasons that are unclear and not challenged, only contains sex offenders' names and birth years, but not complete dates of birth. So think about that. What if your name is John Smith and you were born in 1975? Well, you know, this is going to be flagged here. It doesn't even have the complete date of birth. So in an attempt to cast a broad net where information is incomplete, Little League Agreement specifies that First Advantage will search for sex offender records using only the first and last name in any jurisdictions where the database lacks those complete dates of birth. And then Little League would review available demographic data uh, from the relevant state's website before determining the sex offender record actually belongs to an applicant. So 
the agreement between Little League and First Advantage says, look, all we're going to do is run the first and last name and date of birth or year of birth. And if there's a match, then Little League, you have to go dig into that particular state's website to figure out, okay, this John Smith 1975, is that really the John Smith that's wanting to coach Little League? And so then we get to the facts of this case. So uh, did not find a match in criminal records, but it did find a sex offender record, a Keith Dodson. Now remember, that was the plaintiff's former name, and we'll get to that in just a second. Keith Dodson in Pennsylvania. So it's a name-only search because it did not include the complete date of birth. So when we say a name-only, we mean it's just matching the name here. It's not you know, figuring out, well, okay, were you born on June 1st, 1975? So then First Advantage prepares a background report on Erickson. His name at that time was Keith Dodson to send a Little League. And here's the disclaimer. This record's matched by first name, last name only. So not even date of birth. It may not belong to your subject. Your further review of the state sex offender, so that would be Pennsylvania, website is required in order to determine if this is your subject. Then directed Little League to Pennsylvania sex offender data to compare the demographic data, available photographs, and they might conclude that this does not belong to Erickson. Again, his name at that time was Keith Dodson. So First Advantage, the credit bureau, also sends the consumer, Erickson or Dodson, a letter saying he shared the same name with a known criminal or registered sex offender and that that record would be sent to Little League. And Little League is aware this record may not be yours and Little League is committed to investigating further if it planned to deny his application. So they're saying, look, Mr. Consumer, your name popped up. We told Little League. Little League knows this may not be yours and they have promised us that they will do a deeper investigation if they want to take any action on this. And finally, the report itself assured Erickson that if Little League planned to take adverse action, it must first provide him a copy of the report. So, court points out any non-sex offender would likely feel worried about receiving that kind of report, but Erickson was devastated. He shared a name with his biological father, and though he'd severed all contact years before, he knew his father was the source of that match. So he goes into damage control mode. He called First Advantage, his wife, contacted Little League. So the first advantage rep said, look, this was based only on your name. And Little League said, this sort of stuff happens. And so Erickson uh, decides I'm not going to coach my son's team because I'm just so embarrassed and humiliated by this. And so then he wants to make sure this never happens again. So Erickson and his wife decided to change their family's last name from Dodson to Erickson. So that's why we have, this is known as Erickson versus First Advantage. This uh, was hard for him. He'd been known, been known by his last name throughout his military career. And I didn't know this, but military rules require that you have to disclose the reason for your name change to others in the chain of command. And that was very upsetting and painful for him. And then... He had explained to friends and family, neighbors, why they were changing their name. And, you know, I, I suppose if you're going to say to your neighbor, hey, my name's no longer Dodson, it's now Erickson, kind of people want to know why. And so he has to then explain about his father's status. So it's very upsetting to him. So then two months after getting that notification, he sues First Advantage. So I don't know if he disputed anything. So we would dispute through section 1681I. Remember, I stands for investigation. I don't know if he did that. Maybe he did and it got corrected, but at least the way the opinion is written, the only thing he sued under is 15 USC section 1681EB. This is the section that requires credit bureaus. So people like First Advantage to follow reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy. And he says, hey, this is what happened. The court points out, well, if you're suing under this section, first you have to show that the report failed to comply with maximum possible accuracy and that you were harmed by it. So there's a jury trial. He calls some witnesses. 
and then he rests. So let, let me just explain this because a lot of these Fair Credit Reporting Act cases, we don't have trials. So here's the very quick version of a trial. Both sides select the jury. Then the plaintiff, the consumer, puts on his or her case first. So they call their witnesses. Now each witness can be cross-examined by the other side. But once the plaintiff, the consumer, is done saying, I put forth all the evidence that I want to put forth, then you, quote, rest. You say, I am done. Now the defendant then says to the judge, in almost every case, judge, there was insufficient evidence. No reasonable jury could find in favor of the plaintiff. So enter judgment as a matter of law. If you read older cases, uh, this was known as a directed verdict. Kind of think of it like the judge says to the jury, I'm directing you to find a verdict. And literally the judge just entered the order. Well, now we call it judgment as a matter of law. So the district court granted that motion, finding that he had failed to establish two essential elements. The report was inaccurate and that it caused harm, which is exactly what the 11th Circuit said you have to do. So let's now look at the arguments. There are three arguments raised, but the court says, since you lose the first argument, we don't have to reach the other ones. So that argument that loses is that violated the Fair Credit Reporting Act's maximum possible accuracy because it was false and misleading. So remember, accuracy is it's truthful and it does not mislead. Okay, so it could be truthful, but it misleads. Well, that would be inaccurate or it could be uh, just flat out inaccurate. Okay, and then you really don't have to worry about misleading. And then there's an evidentiary argument and some damages uh, but none of those matter because, unfortunately, the consumer loses on the first uh, first argument. Because we conclude first advantage did not violate the act, there can be no willful violation, nor can there be any actionable reputational harm. So, they say, let's give some background on the Fair Credit Reporting Act. One of the purposes is to ensure fair and accurate reporting about consumers. So, how do we do that? Well, we say, all right, consumer reporting agencies like Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, Innovus, Clarity, DataX, First Advantage, all these companies, you must follow reasonable procedures to ensure maximum possible accuracy of information in consumer reports. And consumers harmed when the credit bureau doesn't do that can sue. They can sue for compensatory damages, to compensate, they can sue for punitive damages, to punish and deter, they can sue for statutory damages, which can be, even if you can't prove harm, you can still recover some money. All right, so let's look now at what we have. Previously explained to make out a claim for 1681EB must show at least two things. It's inaccurate and that that caused damages, okay? So because they don't reach this idea of willfulness, we don't really get in statutory damages. So just understand it can get a little confusing. If you don't have actual damages, can you get statutory damages? That's not really the purpose of this video. So let's just go with what they've got here. It's got to be inaccurate and you have to be damaged. Absent those showings, particularly the inaccurate report, the reasonableness of their procedures is unimportant. Because they could have the worst procedures in the world, but if they somehow stumble backwards into accurate credit reporting, then you can't complain about their procedures. So district court saw Erickson's case as doubly deficient. It was not materially, materially misleading and did not damage. So then they say, well, first we've got to decide, does it comply with maximum possible accuracy? So this court has not yet decided exactly what ma maximum possible accuracy standard entails. So, you know, here's a, a couple of cases. Now, when it says stating in dicta, that just means it was not necessary for the court to say this. So it's not really binding on future opinions. But obviously courts look at this. So the better reading requires a credit report to be both accurate and not misleading. And then there are other things that talk about, well, this judge said only technical accuracy. And well, what if it's technically accurate, but it's misleading? And so 
here's where the 11th Circuit has now spoken. We don't see why the act should not be read to require that a report be both technically accurate and not misleading. So we've got some sort of <laughs> negatives there. So the report has to be accurate and it has to be such that it will not mislead people who are reading it. Okay. So some courts have said, including courts in Alabama, that all that matters is if it's technically accurate. If it's technically accurate, it doesn't matter if it would confuse people, mislead people. The 11th Circuit, which is over Alabama, Georgia, Florida, is saying, no, no, no. For a credit bureau to say this is accurate information, it has to be literally accurate and it must not mislead. And they say, we think statutory text demands this. After all, the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires more than just accuracy. It requires maximum possible accuracy. The words maximum and possible mean greatest in quantity or highest in degree attainable. Accuracy, in turn, means freedom from mistake or error. Uh, free from misunderstanding of the meaning or implication of something, not deviating from truth or accuracy. So the definitions all point in one direction, that to reach maximum possible accuracy, information must be factually true and also unlikely to lead to misunderstanding. So under that standard report that contains factually incorrect information is plainly inaccurate. That's the end. You can stop right there. If it's factually incorrect, then it is plainly inaccurate. Also, a report that contains factually correct information so that's the opposite of what we we're just talking about, but nonetheless misleads its users as to its meaning or implication. That would be a failure of following this law, this rule. So then they say, look, whether a report is misleading. So we're not talking about whether it's factually correct or incorrect. That's literally a factual matter. I mean, either it is or it isn't, but this idea of, well, what if it's technically correct, but I say as a consumer, it's misleading. They say this is an objective measurement, one that should be interpreted in an even-handed manner toward the interest of both consumers and potential creditors in fair and accurate credit reporting. And then they say, scroll up here, uh, if a report is so misleading that it is objectively likely to cause the intended user, the user's the one that purchases the credit report. So not talking about the consumer, not talking about the credit bureau, but in this example, Little League would be the user. If you go to your car dealership and apply for a car loan, the car loan or the, the bank or the car dealership, however it works, they would be the user of the report. So if it's so misleading that it's likely to cause the user to take adverse action against the consumer, it is not maximally accurate. On the other hand, the fact that some user somewhere could possibly squint at a report and imagine a reason to think twice about its subject would not render the report objectively misleading. So in sum, a report must be factually incorrect, objectively likely to mislead its intended user or both. And, and so this is really important. And let me just highlight this here. Because again, sometimes people make the argument, I've heard credit bureaus say, well, you know, this is factually wrong what we have, but it would not mislead. So therefore, it doesn't violate statute. No, no, no. Let's read this again. A report must be factually incorrect, comma, objectively likely to mislead its intended user, comma, or both. So you know, we have, it can be A, B, or C, and C is A plus B, okay? So it can be just factually incorrect, or it could be objectively likely to mislead its intended user. If you have either one of those, and certainly if you have both, now you have shown that the law has been violated. All right, so now that we have the standard, now let's look at the facts of this case and say, did Little League, or, or did this report that Little League was the user of, did this violate section 1681 EB for maximum possible accuracy? To begin, the Little League report was factually accurate. And by Little League report, they mean the one from First Advantage here. The report stated a registered sex offender in Pennsylvania shared the first and last name. That's true. 
and did not wrongfully attribute that record to the consumer. Closer to the opposite, in fact, to explain the matching records located using a name-only search. Let me just pause here. The CFPB came out after this and basically said, guys, if you're doing a name-only search, we, the CFPB, view that you are not following the law, or at least you're in danger of not following law. They were not happy about this decision. All right, so the consumer says this is not enough. He says it was patently inaccurate. It was requested for him and include a sex offender record. He is not a sex offender. So you see the logic there. You know, I'm not a sex offender. You run a report to see if I'm a sex offender. And now it, it has my name on it. But it says the conclusion just does not follow from its premises. Report never assigned a sex offender record to the plaintiff, the consumer. Again, it suggests the record might not be connected to him. Simply put, the report was what it said it was, an alert that someone by the name of Keith Dodgson had a Pennsylvania sex offender record. And so remember, they're taking this in two steps. Number one, is the report literally, factually accurate or inaccurate? Well, they say that it was accurate. But the plaintiff doesn't lose just because of that, because now we say, well, even though it was accurate, was it misleading? So this brings us to the second prong of the test, whether the report was misleading. And they say it was not misleading. Here, the only objective, reasonable interpretation of the report was one that was not misleading. Well, why do you say that, 11th Circuit? A reasonable user of this report, standing in the shoes of Little League, that is the user, uh, who hired a consumer reporting agency to search an internal database for sex offender records knowing it would only be performed by name and knowing further research was required before saying, yes, this does match the person that we're pulling the report on, would not be misled by the report to such an extent that it would take negative action against the consumer. And they knew it would get what it asked for, a search based on first and last name. It could not attribute any of those records without conducting further research. In fact, the report reminded Little League that further review of the state sex offender website was required to see. And then they point out, to be sure, this is not a license to caveat one's way out of liability. So in other words, they're saying, you can't just have the sloppy report and then put a disclaimer up top says, oh, by the way, uh, you know, this might not be accurate. They're saying, no, 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 we're not doing that. So we've all run into large print headlines or promises that are belied by lengthy fine print at the bottom. That would be objectively misleading. Nor will vague equivocations like the criminal history side of may not be 100% accurate suffice to save an otherwise misleading report. Some cases will be closer than this one, require tighter judgment. But here the report's language made clear the report was, it, sorry, let me start that out. The language made clear what the report was and was not, and it was prepared consistent with the expectations of the requester, the requester being Little League. So this report was both factually correct, remember that's step one, and free from potential for misunderstanding, step two. And so then they say, so the trial court, the district court judge did the right thing and then they end it here. It may well be the report harmed the consumer, not because of any inaccuracies, but because it brought the light difficult pass of his estranged father. But an accurate report is not actionable, no matter how embarrassing or hurtful it may prove. This is important because sometimes I see people have the idea, well, hey, you can't put any late payments on my credit report because that would be embarrassing to me. Well, the question is, are they accurate? Hey, you can't put a charge off on my credit report. Well, again, the question is, is this accurate? Now, we also have to make sure that it's complete information, that it's not uh, staying on there too long. But with the, going back to this case, I really wanted you to see this to sort of drive home the point of what does that expression, that phrase in the statute, the procedure, reasonable procedure for maximum possible accuracy, so what does that mean? Well, here they focus really on the, the last part, accuracy, okay? Now, if they had decided the report was inaccurate or was likely to mislead, then I think they would go back to the first part, which is, okay, we know that it's inaccurate or it's likely to mislead. Did you 
the credit bureau have reasonable procedures in place. Okay. Now I'll just give you a little practice tip from, you know, doing this type of work for 20 years. There are times where we bring a claim only under this section, section 1681EB. Normally, when we can, we want to do a dispute, and that's under section 1681I, because a lot of courts say, look, it's actually a, a, a greater burden, a greater standard on the credit bureau once you do a dispute, because you have pinpointed the error. Instead of this section 1681EB, this is the argument. I don't really buy this, but this is the argument. Well, the credit bureaus have so much data, so they really can't spend much time actually making sure it's accurate. Well, that's what the law says. <laughs> the statute says reasonable procedures to ensure maximum possible accuracy. But as a practical matter, most courts say, well, once you dispute it, assuming you point out the errors, you pointed out what's wrong, you made it very clear, it's not ambiguous, it's not vague, now there's a heightened obligation on the credit bureau. And it also sort of loops back around into EB because now when they then update your report and you've already told them there's a problem, well, we, then we sue them under both, right? We sue them under 1681I for doing a lousy investigation and under EB both before the dispute, but certainly after the dispute, we say you didn't have reasonable procedures. We told you this was a problem. So you should have had really particular attention paid to this. So we use this and sometimes it's all we have. And that may be the case here. It may have been the only thing that the consumer had. And obviously this greatly bothered the consumer. Just unfortunately for the consumer, the credit bureau said this report was technically accurate and not likely to mislead. Okay, guys, thanks for watching this video. Uh, feel free to leave your comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these. Uh, I'm going to do more of these case decisions, and if there are any particular ones you want me to do, just leave that in a comment. I've grabbed some from the 11th Circuit, but also have one. Uh, let me see, I've got this pulled up here. Uh, this actually came out a couple days ago. It's called Woods versus LVNV Funding, a very odd uh, identity theft type case and very important for us to study this if we're dealing with identity theft. So you guys have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye.